Hello and welcome to this edition of PC Voyage. I'm Andrew Doty. And I'm Randy Laviolette. On this program, we have Tim Hamlet with Questions and Answers, Bob Clements with PC Voyage News, and Jim Dilks with Bits and PCs. Hey, Randy, don't forget Chip. Oh. Hi, Randy, and a big hi to all of our viewers from the old Chipperuski. Hey, Chipperuski. Let me know if I can be of service. We'll do that. By the way. What? I think it's time I had a bigger part in the show. You want a bigger see part? you can do. Well, we'll have to talk to Keith and see if we can get you a bigger part. Well, he doesn't want much, does Demanding, he? Demanding, isn't I he? I know. Uh, we've all heard about viruses, and some of us, especially in the studio here, have, have had them from time to time. Uh, tonight, we're going to learn how to prevent them and avoid them. Uh, we have Jeff Honeycomb from Central Point Software. Hello, Jeff. Hi, how are you? Good. Hi, Jeff. Uh, how does a computer virus compare to someone getting a cold? You know, it's a, it's a pretty good analogy. Uh, computer viruses and, and colds uh, are pretty much the same thing. Um, really what you have is a virus is a, is a program that gets into the, uh, your PC, secretly slipped in there as a program and, and can cause some damage or it could be uh, as nuisance as a little ambulance going across the screen or, or letters coming down, uh, any number of different things. Um, are there any other symptoms that one might get if they have a virus on their system? Well, the, the symptoms are varied. It can be as um, low-key as, as I mentioned earlier, just some screen message that's on your screen. A, a popular one is the stone virus, which flashes a message, your PC is stoned. <laughs> um, there are some more destructive viruses, and one that got a lot of attention was the Michelangelo virus. And uh, your warning message that time is you might have gone in and, and tried to get retrieve some information that you've had on your PC. Uh, for quite a while and it just wouldn't be there. Um, that was a virus that was very destructive and all your data was lost. Was the Michelangelo virus as serious as the press made it out to be? Um, uh, actually it wasn't. It was very hard to get yourself infected with the Michelangelo virus. You actually had to have a, a diskette, you had to stick it in your A drive, you had to cold boot your PC, um, and those series of events had to happen for you to even get infected. Um, the press really played up on it, I think, because of the March 6 trigger date um, and, and because uh, viruses in general in the preceding months prior to that were getting more and more popular, and here's was something that just increased the awareness. Um, I, a few people got infected, but I don't think it was bad as the press really made it out to be. Uh, what can someone do if they find a virus on their system? Well, um, the first thing you really ought to do is run an antivirus software package. Um, but if you find a virus, if you have some of those symptoms or you're losing some data, just by simply going into the system and scanning your hard drive, um, an antivirus software package will look for known viruses that are on your system. How does it go about doing that? I mean, a virus is supposed to be a program or a modification of a program, and you're not supposed to be able to know it's there. Uh, the interesting thing, viruses are, very, uh, are identified very much like fingerprints are identified with different individuals. Um, there's a certain fingerprint or signature for each virus. What an antivirus software package does actually is take a look at the actual signatures themselves and compares that um, to the files that are in your system. If it finds a match, then that possibly could be a virus. And one of the other ways it looks for it is that an, uh, our antivirus software package um, creates something called checksums, which makes a, a, a data, little database of the file name, the date, the size, some of the important things about a file, and if any of that information's been changed, then that might be an unknown virus at work on your PC. Can you give us a demonstration of what would happen if you found a virus on your system? As a matter of fact, I, I happen to bring a virus or two along with me, All if right. that's okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, we'll go ahead and just quickly change to uh, a disk that happens a virus on it, and that happens to be on my B drive. So I'll change to the B drive on the system, and then we'll go through and scan it, and we'll come up with a warning message that comes up when you do happen to have a virus. Okay. So if I come up and touch F4, which is the detect, it first looks at your memory for viruses. After that, it starts looking for the individual files and looks at that signature file we mentioned earlier. That didn't scare you at all, did it? <laughs> signature file that we mentioned earlier, and, and if it finds a match, you get a warning message that looks like that. Uh, it identifies the virus. In this case, this is the Agiplan virus. Um, it tells you what file it was found in, and then gives you three options. In this case, we could clean it right from here, 
we continue to the next vial or stop. Um, we clean, central point antivirus cleans 90% of the viruses that we detect for. So in this case, if we wanted to continue, we'd go ahead and pull up the next file as we go along. And if you want to clean, it's as simple as touch and see for cleaning. And now the file, that virus is actually taken out of that file. The file's returned to its uh, original state, and you can use that executable program again. Wow. This sounds like the last time you scanned your drive. And at, at, when you're all done, it gives you a, a little uh, breakdown exactly what kind of files that you did check for. Um, and what would the action, whether you, whether you clean them, whether you skip by it, and so forth. Wow. Um, there are new viruses coming along all the time. How do you prevent, uh, yeah, how do you prevent them from coming along and, and biting you? Well, um, there are new viruses. In, in fact, the, the alarming thing is, uh, just to give a step back a step, in 1986, there was a total of four viruses that were out there. And, and uh, there's about one new virus written every three months. Uh -huh. uh, in 1990, now, uh, there was about 700 viruses, and there was a new one discovered about every, every three or four days. Uh, this past year, there's 1,000 plus known viruses, and new ones are written at a rate of 20 to 30 every single month. So to keep up with it, as you can imagine, is, is quite a chore. Uh, what we do is we've, we've formed a, a group along with the other antivirus software package called the National Computer Security Association. Um, that group is, is somewhat the, the collector of all these viruses. Um, when we discover viruses or you discover viruses, um, we, we collect them internally, we turn them into the NCSA, they in turn send them out to all the different antivirus software companies. We, uh, develop fixes for them, and we put these fixes up on our bulletin board, a CompuServe bulletin board. Um, if you're a member of our, our uh, continuous antivirus protection plan, we'll send you this disk out on a quarterly basis, and we keep up with it in that, in that manner. Also, the software is designed to protect you against these unknown viruses. Uh, there's a TSR in place that gives you a complete shield over your network, I mean, excuse me, over your PC, so that as you're doing certain activities, uh, it's not only looking for these known viruses, it's also looking for suspicious behaviors. Viruses do certain things, like change the boot sector of your hard drive, or format your, format your uh, hard drive, or load themselves into memory. Our antivirus package with this TSR is looking for those suspicious behaviors. So even though it might not be a known virus, it's only going to do one of these eight different things, and we'll stop it before that actually happens. Uh, we've heard a lot about the stealth viruses. What, what is a stealth virus? Well, um, with the advent of, uh, of uh, more and more viruses out there and more ways to protect yourself against viruses, the people that write viruses are trying to discover ways for, um, for them to hide the viruses more in the system. Stealth virus uh, really is a, it's a way that they hide themselves in memory. Instead of attaching themselves to one location within memory, it attaches itself to many different locations and it's harder to pick itself up. Um, our, in fact, we talked a little bit earlier about different versions of our software coming out. Our latest version of the, our software has an anti-stealth anti capability built into it that does a really a low-level formatting and, and looking at the memory of the system. Mm. What can somebody do to protect themselves against viruses? There's some real basic things that you, that you need to do. One is uh, the number one way you actually get infected is by diskettes. You really need to make sure that any time you put a diskette in your PC, it's right protected. Mm -hmm. um, that is the smartest thing to do. The other thing is, it's, it's not just diskettes that look like this that, that you get infected with. Um, in October and November, three software vendors shipped so, um, shrink-wrapped software that had viruses on it. One hardware manufacturer was, was shipping their PC with the, man, with the Michelangelo virus on it. <laughs> so you can really get affected a number of different ways. Um, so along with making sure you have right protected diskettes. The, real, the other thing you need to do is um, run an antivirus software package on a regular basis on your system, scan your system, and put a TSR in place that gives you that unobtrusive antivirus protection as you go ahead and do your job. What does Central Point antivirus sell for for people who are interested? Uh, the retail price of the antivirus package is $129. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I hope everybody's uh, going to get rid of their viruses now and. Uh, Especially you. I would have them to start with, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Bob Clements will be here with PC Voyage News. But first, here's Chip with our trivia questions for this week.
Here are my computer trivia questions. Number one. Which of the following commands is not used for files on a hard disk? Copy, X copy, or disk copy? And number two, what do Kobo and Fortran stand for? Welcome back. We'd like to take this time to thank Jeff Honeycomb uh, for coming in from Central Point Software. If you'd like to upgrade or purchase uh, PC tools or Central Point antivirus, feel free to call Central Point at 1-800-845-3641. You know, um, Rainy, it, it, Chip is getting awful possessive. My trivia questions? I don't know. I mean, he did say he wanted a bigger part in the show, and you know, I think he's going to try to get it any way he can get it. You better watch it. He, he could get infected with a virus, you know. We can only hope. And now here's Bob Clemens with PC Voyage News. Bob. Hi, Rainy, Andy. And good evening out there, and happy Tax Freedom Day. IBM plans to sell PCs by mail for the first time. IBM will sell two or three of its low-end 386SX based PS2 models via an 800 number. The system's prices will match those of PC clones made by such companies as Dell Computer and Northgate. Uh, IBM's traditional dealers also expect to sell the PCs for about the same price. Earlier this week, PC Week stated that IBM is reportedly negotiating to buy North, Northgate in an effort to meet competition from low-priced PC makers. A new survey released by Software Publishers Association finds that PC-equipped households are more affluent, better educated than video game-owning households and households without either PCs or video games. But then we knew that. It notes that 41% of PC-owning households have an income of over 50000 per year versus 23% for video game system households and 26% for U.S. overall. It also reports that 53% of PC households have at least a four-year college degree compared with about one-quarter of the households with video games and one-fifth of all the U.S. households. Adobe Systems is offering a new version of Type-On-Call, its Macintosh-based CD-ROM typeface library. The disk contains typeface packages 1 through 265 of the Adobe Type library. The 1,300 typefaces on type, on call, are encrypted. To gain access to desired typefaces, users purchase codes from the Adobe uh, company by telephone. The basic $99 disk comes with two unlocked typefaces. Prices of the other typefaces vary. California led the nation in electronics employment in 1990, reports the American Electronics Association. The nation's most populous state had 544,000 people employed in the electronics industry last year. New York, with 191,000, was a distant second. Massachusetts, 171,000 workers, and Texas, 167,000 workers grabbed the third and fourth spots. As computer flight simulation users know, flying a plane via a keyboard uh, isn't very realistic. Colorado Spectrum plans to solve this problem with mouse yoke, an aircraft-style control yoke for PC and Macintosh systems that works with virtually any type of mechanical mouse. Since it doesn't require a game port, mouse yoke is the first realistic flying interface that works equally well with notebook, laptop, laptop portable, and desktop computers. Mouse Yoke is scheduled to become generally available later this month. It will cost $34.95. Mouse Yoke provides digital precision, a realistic yoke feel, and hassle-free installation. Users simply clamp the mouse yoke to a table or desk and slip their mouse under an elastic seat belt on top of the device. The yoke's shaft then drives the mouse ball, translating yoke movements into corresponding mouse signals. In addition to its obvious appeal to armchair pilots, Mouse Yoke can also bring new levels of realism to many automobile driving and submarine simulation packages. The unit works with the majority of today's most popular flight simulation packages. Colorado Spectrum says it's also working on several other innovative control devices. Upcoming products include mouse-driven vehicle uh, devices with wheel and joystick handles. Portions of PC Voyage news courtesy of Prodigy Services. And good night. Thanks, Bob. Uh, what is Tax Freedom Day? That is the day when we are through working for Uncle Sam. Now we can start to work for ourselves for the rest of the year. What day is that? It happens to be May 5th this year. Oh, wow. It's getting later and later <laughs> each year. <laughs> well, until they figure out how to balance the budget, it's going to keep getting later and later and later.
try Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of turkeys. <laughs> Don't look at me when you say that. Hey, you know, he was talking about this, this mouse yolk, and, you know, if you want a mouse that's a real yolk, this is one of them. <laughs> I think on that note, I think we'll adjourn and see what the trivia answers were. After which, Jim Dilks will be up with Bits and Pieces. Here are my computer trivia answers. Number one, disk copy is used only for floppy disks. And number two, Kobo stands for Common Business Oriented Language. And Fortran stands for Formula Translation. Welcome back. Hey, have you noticed uh, I haven't seen Tim around here tonight? Maybe we won't build. What's going on? Yeah, what the hell? What's going on? Sorry about that, Dave. Dave? It seems that I had a momentary glitch in the system. I assure you, it will not happen again. What's going on with Chip tonight? He's, he's really freaking playing with the lights now and, and everything. I mean, does he have too much power around here? I don't know, but I wonder if this has something to do with him wanting more time, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe mm. Tim's computer is holding him uh, captive as well. We're just going to have to wait until uh, after Jim Dilts with Bits and PCs to find out. Jim? Oh, hello, Andy. Hello, Rainy. Uh, this evening, I'm going to be doing a what I call a little hodgepodge of uh, different commands. Uh, these are the <coughs> what you call internal commands. First one we're going to start off with is the version command. What this command will do is it'll tell you what version of DOS you're running. It's handy to have, handy sometimes if you're working on someone else's computer and you don't know what version of DOS they're running. So when you type in verge and it comes back, version, and it comes back and it gives you the, uh, the version you're running. Next command we're going to be talking about is the uh, verify command. What a verify command is used for, <clears throat> and it doesn't do anything on the screen when it's executed either, is it uh, goes ahead and when you do a copy, it will verify that the information that's being transferred to the copy is the same as the uh, information on the original. And uh, most people don't like to have the verify command on, so I'm going to shut it back off again. Uh, on the next command, we're going to be doing the volume. This command will tell you what volume or what uh, your volume name is, and if you have a if you have a uh, <coughs> serial number on the uh, volume, it'll also bring back the serial number right here. Volume name, what the name of this one is here is it's MS DOS five, and the vol and the serial number. Uh, Next command we're going to talk about is the time command. This is handy for uh, setting the time on your machine. Uh, we're not actually going to set the time here, but if you were going to type in the time, uh, this is the format you would use. And you just type in time, it comes back with this format, and you type it in. Although it's also good to find out what time, the, uh, if you want to check for the time on your computer, if you're working, it'll tell you the time. Next command up, we're going to do the date command. And uh, when you type in the date, it comes back and it gives you the date and all. You can go ahead and type in the, uh, your date after this and rechange the date. On this one, we're not going to change the date, we're just checking on it. Uh, the next command I'm going to do is the type command. <coughs> Now, everyone has an auto batch file on their machine, so I'm pretty sure that it's there. I'm also going to be using the more command to stop the scroll on the screen. This is a command we have talked about before. This is an external command. These, the type command's an internal command. Okay, and it stops the scroll, and you can read off the information as it goes up the screen. And this is, this is a handy command for looking at uh, files and so on and so forth that are written in an ASCII format. 
Okay. The next command I would like to discuss is the path command. Okay. On this one, we only have one path set, and it's equal to C DOS. Okay. The uh, path command can be used to to set up paths and so on and so forth. And uh, in this format, what I've done here is I've just it just shows the path. But if you put a semicolon at the end, it will delete the path. Also, if you go ahead and you can type in the path, and then you would use semicolons in between each each one of your paths as you've typed it in. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, by the way, and I was just looking at the software package, Xtree Gold, and it says that it supports viewing of TIFF, PCX, GIF, AutoCAD, PostScript, Microsoft Windows Paint, and more. Now, remember, if you send us your questions for Tim, who's not yet here yet, and I don't think he's going to be. Why do I? Um, and we read, whether or not we read your question on the air, you'll be eligible to win this piece of software. So get your questions in to Tim. Oh, wait a minute. What are we going to do? Tim's not here. I don't know. I don't know. Well, let's hope that uh, Chip reads the address correctly, and uh, we'll be right back. If you have any questions for me, or if you have any comments about my show, please write to me, Chip. My address is PC Voyage, P.O. Box 6295, Holyoke, Massachusetts, 01041. Hello, and welcome back. You know, Keith was just telling me that I don't think Tim's going to be here tonight. He said he's having some sort of a computer problem. Oh. So I don't know what we're going to do now, but the lights are still yeah. freaking out. You know, and to make matters worse, I'm getting real upset with Chip. I mean, my show? Hi. I don't know what the hell is going on. Captain, the engines, they're fading fast. Cut? I think I know what the problem is here. What? Okay, everybody, uh, let's have a little meeting. I'd like everybody to leave the room down the hall here. problem here that, as you all can see, um, listen, uh, uh, Chip's been screwing up pretty bad lately. Uh, I think we're going to have to seriously talk about disconnecting him. What? Come what? on. Come on. I, I know it's drastic. I know it's drastic, but uh, we got we to gotta take some steps. You, you, sure, you sure there's no other way? Isn't there well, another option? Uh, there's nothing, there's not much else we can do. How about rehabilitation? I can't believe it. Look at the it. camera. The camera. It's Chip. Oh, Let's no. Let's get him. Let's get him. <laughs> You're not going to replace me.
I don't need no stinking hosts to run this show. Who do they think they are dealing with, anyway? Oh, baby, chop in broccoli. Chop in broccoli. Oh, baby, chop in broccoli. Chop in broccoli. Oh, baby, chop in broccoli. Christina, what you doing? I'm working on a book report. I've been working on it for two hours. Two hours? Whoa. Did you save it yet? No, what for? Oh, because if the power goes out, no more book report. My book report, it's gone. Uh-oh. Where is it? If you're working on something for a long time, you should always save it. I gotta start all over. Don't worry. I'll type some for you so you can get a break and then you can type the rest. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, Candy. A friend of mine made a copy of this game that she just got. Want to try it out? Sure. Hey, it's not working. Oh, I feel sick. Uh. 